Been looking forward to this. Mom's happy Mother's Day. <laughs> I've had somebody, uh, t yes, <laughs> I had somebody wish me a happy Mother's Day, <laughs> to which I just responded, yeah, I, I had a mom. I, I had to have a mom, and so did everybody here anyway. Um, so before we get started, we do want to take a moment to bless all the mothers on this Mother's Day. And um, this last week, I had really sought the Lord and sensed from the Lord that I was to do something a bit different. Actually, I did this many years back uh, in my church on Mother's Day uh, on the mainland. So I thought it would be fitting uh, today to do it as well. And the reason is, is that the role a mother plays in the life of a child can never be underestimated can never be understated. And what's interesting is we're seeing this on Thursday nights in our study through the Bible. We're in the Old Testament book of 2 Chronicles, almost done with 2 Chronicles, but in chapter 34 on Thursday night, we were reintroduced to King Josiah, one of the greatest kings in the history of Israel there in Judah. And what makes it so interesting about this particular king is he had a really, really, really evil father but he had a really, really, really godly mother. And the influence that his godly mother had on this, he, he began to reign as king. Get this, you know at what age? Eight. Eight. <laughs> That's pretty young. And in his teens, at the age of 16, he reinstituted the worship there in the temple. At age 26, he completely re renovated and remodeled the temple and got rid of all of the idolatrous worship. I'm not trying to teach the Thursday night Bible study again this morning, but it's so fascinating. And many Bible commentators uh, attribute the, the godliness of this king as a young man to the influence that his mother had on his life. Well, a number of years ago when our two sons were still very young, my wife and I would read them a book titled I'll Love You Forever by Robert Munch. And again, I thought it would be appropriate to share it with you today. You might be interested to go online. You can purchase the book. Uh, also, you might want to uh, read about the powerful story uh, behind the, this timeless classic. I know you'll be blessed if you do. A mother held her new baby and very slowly rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she held him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The baby grew, he grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was two years old and he ran all around the house. He pulled all the books off the shelves, he pulled all the food out of the refrigerator and he took his mother's watch and flushed it down the toilet. Sometimes his mother would say, this kid is driving me crazy. But at nighttime, when that two-year-old was quiet, she opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, looked up over the side of his bed, and if he was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. The little boy grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was nine years old, and he never wanted to come in for dinner. He never wanted to take a bath. And when grandma visited, he always said bad words Sometimes his mother wanted to sell him to the zoo. But at nighttime, when he was asleep, the mother quietly opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that nine-year-old boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. 
The boy grew, he grew, and he grew, and he grew. He grew until he was a teenager. <laughs> he had strange friends, and he wore strange clothes, and he listened to strange music. Sometimes the mother felt like she was in a zoo, but at nighttime, when that teenager was asleep, the mother opened the door to his room, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of the bed. If he was really asleep, she picked up that great big boy and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. While she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. That teenager grew. He grew and he grew and he grew. He grew until he was a grown-up man. He left home and got a house across town. But sometimes on dark nights, the mother got into her car and drove across town. If all the lights in her son's house were out, she opened his bedroom window, crawled across the floor, and looked up over the side of his bed. If that great big man was really asleep, she picked him up and rocked him back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while she rocked him, she sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm living, my baby you'll be. Well, that mother, she got older. She got older and older and older. One day she called up her son and said, you better come see me because I'm very old and sick. So her son came to see her. When he came in the door, she tried to sing the song. She sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. But she couldn't finish because she was too old and sick. The son... went to his mother, he picked her up and rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And he sang this song, I'll love you forever, I'll like you for always, as long as I'm living, my mommy you'll be. When the son came home that night, he stood for a long time, top of the stairs, and he went into the room where his very new baby daughter was sleeping. He picked her up in his arms and very slowly rocked her back and forth, back and forth, back and forth. And while he rocked her, he sang, I'll love you forever. I'll like you for always. As long as I'm with you, my baby you'll be. Proverbs 31, 28 and 29 of mothers says, her children rise up and call her blessed, her husband also, and he praises her. Many daughters have done well, but you excel them all. It's at this time that I would like for all the mothers to stand so that we too can bless you, call you blessed, and thank you, and as well, pray uh, for you. And by the way, I'm so sorry I smudged your mascara. <laughs> Loving Heavenly Father, we are so thankful to you, some of us eternally so, for the mother's role in our lives. Standing in our midst today before us are those mothers to whom we owe a great debt of gratitude. Lord, we thank you for them. We pray your blessing on them and we give you all the glory for them. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank you, moms. One of the reasons I, sh I shared that, if I could be so candid, is because I had a very nurturing and loving mother who was always there for me throughout my entire life until the day, day she died, which was May 22nd of 1995. It's been 22 years. And I can't wait until that trumpet sounds and the dead in Christ who will rise first uh, will go up and then we uh, after them. And I will not only see my mommy again, but I will see my, uh, my savior face to face. And so will you. 
Well, let's get into the Word of God, 2 Corinthians chapter 12 today. We're, Lord willing, going to finish the chapter. Our text will be verses 16 through 21. And uh, if you're not already there, I'll ask you to turn there. And once you do, if you're able, I'll ask you to stand. You can follow along as I read. If you're unable, that's all right. The Apostle Paul, after telling them that the more he loves them, the less they love him in return, Paul says, verse 16, Be that as it may, I have not been a burden to you, yet crafty fellow that I am, I caught you by trickery. Did I exploit you through any of the men I sent to you? I urged Titus to go to you, and I sent our brother with him. Titus did not exploit you, did he? Did we not walk in the same footsteps by the same spirit? Have you been thinking all along that we have been defending ourselves to you? We have been speaking in the sight of God as those in Christ. And everything we do, dear friends, is for your strengthening. For I am afraid, verse 20, that when I come, I may not find you as I want you to be, and you may not find me as you want me to be. I fear that there may be discord, jealousy, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. I am afraid that when I come again, my God will humble me before you, and I will be grieved over many who have sinned earlier and have not repented of the impurity, sexual sin, and debauchery in which they have indulged. Let's pray if you would join with me. We'll ask God's blessing on our understanding. Loving Heavenly Father, we're thankful to you this morning for your word and this portion that we have here before us today. But we readily admit that we need for your Holy Spirit to open the eyes of our understanding so that you're able to have unfettered access to our hearts as you minister to us in and through your word. Lord, speak into our lives, we pray. In Jesus' name, amen. You can be seated. Thank you. So today's teaching is going to be part six of a series I've titled, Why We Go Through Trials. For those of you who have been with us over the last several weeks, you've doubtless noticed that this particular series has gone a little bit longer than usual. Sometimes we have a three or four part, but this one has uh, extended beyond that. And I think for what would be deemed obvious reasons when it comes to trials, chapters like the one before us today can be a tremendous source of encouragement, especially for those who are in the midst of a trial. I want to get right to our text this morning, and I want to do this so that we can focus our attention on what I see as three very important truths concerning the trials that God allows into our lives. I say important because if we misunderstand, misinterpret if you prefer, why it is that God allows trials into our lives, we make it unnecessarily difficult for ourselves in the midst of those trials that are in our lives. We sometimes default to this notion that God is somehow angry at us and is punishing us, and nothing could be further from the truth. God has a purpose in those trials. You might be here this morning, and you're going through the trial of your life. I love that, that song we just, I loved all the songs we just sung, but where we just got done singing, I'm going to hold on to you in the storm. God, it's interesting to me, I was just thinking of this this last week, that uh, Jesus uh, has his disciples go into the boat and ahead of them to send them to the other side on the Sea of Galilee where he's going to meet them. And he knowingly sends them into a storm, a perilous storm. And What's interesting is, of course, he comes to them and is walking on water. And this is when Peter says, bid me come. And what's really striking to me about the account is, is that the Lord knowingly sent them into 
the midst of this perilous storm. And I think oftentimes what happens in our lives is that we think that when we're in the midst of a trial, that we're somehow out of the will of God. Never think that because you're going through such a difficult time that you're out of God's will. In fact, if anything, it could be argued that when things are going really well, <laughs> on the other side of the table, that doesn't necessarily mean that you're in the middle of God's will. We, we somehow interpret our, our trials, our difficult circumstances as somehow I must be out of the will of God. Well, maybe you need to remind yourself that the Lord has sent you into that storm. And isn't it interesting, the greater miracle, I'm, I'm not in the Gospels, but this is an interesting uh, account. It, uh, interesting that the greater miracle was in the midst of that storm. Peter actually walked on water. That's not just some words on the page of our Bible. Sometimes God allows us to go through those storms because he wants to do the greater miracle. He wants to do the greater thing, the greater blessing. Well, the first truth in verses 16 through 18 is that trials put us in step or if you prefer, back in step with the Spirit. In verse 16, Paul facetiously tells them he's a crafty man who has caught them by trickery, even though he's never been a financial burden to this church there in Corinth. He goes on in verse 17 to ask them if he in any way had exploited them through any of the men that he had sent to them, namely Titus with whom he's uh, speaking of. In verse 18, he says he urged Titus to go, and he didn't exploit them, but instead they walked in the same footsteps by the same Spirit. You might say they were in sync with the Spirit, in step with the Spirit. In order to better understand what Paul is saying here, it's important that we view this through the lens of the false accusations that have been brought against the Apostle Paul, specifically from the super apostles, the false apostles, who were charging exorbitant speaking fees. The fact of the matter is these fake apostles were in it for the money, and it's for this reason that Paul would never take a dime from the Corinthian church. If he did so, his fear would be that he would become just like the fake apostles which is why, by the way, these fake apostles have become so vicious in their attacks. One commentator explained it this way. Paul's opponents, the most eminent apostles mentioned in 2 Corinthians 11, 5 and 12, 11, were in ministry at least partly for the money. They could not bear the fact that Paul didn't care about money in the ministry. So they assigned their motives to him. Paul proves that the charge he is being crafty is false. He reminds the Corinthian Christians that neither Paul nor any of his associates had ever behaved in a financially inappropriate way before the Corinthians. Here's the fact of the matter. Paul, Titus, et al., were all walking in purity and integrity by virtue of the fact that they were walking according to the Spirit. Maybe you've heard it said this way, the how of the Holy Spirit enables us to do the what of the Holy Word. Perhaps a better way to say it would be, it's impossible to live a holy life absent the Holy Spirit indwelling my life and empowering my life and enabling my life to live a holy life. In other words, when we walk according to the Spirit, we're going to be in step with the Spirit. And as such, we can't be in step with the flesh, according to the flesh. Uh, when my daughter and I walk together, she has, of course, a, a shorter stride. And if I, when I'm holding her hand, if I'm walking with her uh, and she's not in step with me, I'm kind of like dragging her along <laughs> with me. But uh, when she is in step with me, everything just goes smoothly and even 
effortlessly. And if she's in step with me, she's not going to be in step with anyone else. You're either going this direction in step, in sync with the Holy Spirit, or you're going in this direction, the opposite direction, in step and in sync with and according to the flesh. It's either one or the other. By the way, when we get to Galatians and we talk about how it is that if you're walking in the Spirit, you won't fulfill the lust of the flesh. It's in Romans as well. What, what that really is saying is, is that if you're walking in the Spirit, busy in the Spirit about the things of the Spirit, it's impossible. You, you can't clone yourself and walk according to the flesh in that direction and according to the Spirit in this direction. I mean, I know that's an absurd way to illustrate it, but that's what it's saying. If you're in step with the Holy Spirit, you will not be in step and you will not fulfill the lusts of the flesh. Actually, the Apostle Paul expounds on this in his epistle to the church in Rome. In chapter 8, verses 1 and 5, he says, There is therefore now no condemnation to those who are in Christ Jesus, who do not walk according to the flesh, but according to the Spirit. For those who live according to the flesh... Listen, set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. See, this was the problem with the church in Corinth. They were carnal Christians that were walking according to the lusts of the flesh. I would suggest that, like the Corinthians, we too in our carnality are brought back to the Lord in step with the Spirit of the Lord by way of fiery trials, which serve the purpose of getting us back in the Spirit, out of the flesh and back in the Spirit. And thankfully, God doesn't use condemnation to do it. There is no condemnation. All of the guilt and condemnation and damnation even was placed on Jesus Christ on that cross almost 2,000 years ago. And so, rather than condemnation, it's the Holy Spirit's conviction. And there's a huge difference. In fact, this over the years in my own personal walk with the Lord has served as a great litmus test to know whether or not what I'm sensing is of the Lord or not. Let me explain what I mean by that. If I'm condemned, the test for me is, is that it draws me away from the Lord. It puts distance in between me and the Lord. And conversely, if it's the conviction of the Holy Spirit, it draws me nearer to the Lord, closer to the Lord. And by the way, that's kind of across the board a, a principle I think that is very applicable. Uh, when it comes to the music we listen to, the kind of entertainment we seek, the kind of movies we watch, it, does it draw me closer to the Lord or does it put distance between me and the Lord? That's how you can discern whether it's in step with the Spirit or is this according to the flesh. See, if I know that somebody's mad at me, <laughs> namely my dad, um, who was mad at me a lot growing up, uh, I, I, I w would make an effort to just be sound asleep when he came home at night so I didn't have to be on the receiving end of his wrath. And in the morning, I would do everything possible to avoid him, put distance in between me and him because there was anger. There's no anger from our Heavenly Father. He's not angry at us. He's not condemning us. No longer is there, for those of us in Christ Jesus, any condemnation. Well, this brings us to verse 19, where we find a second truth concerning trials. And it's that they can be for the benefit of others as well as for myself. Here, Paul asks the Corinthian Christians if they think he's been defending or even excusing himself, as another translation renders it, when he's actually spoken before God in Christ, then 
Paul, interesting, calling them dear friends, goes on to say that everything they do has been for the edifying and strengthening of the Corinthians. What? what what's he saying? Well, here's the question. What's the everything that Paul is referring to that has been for the benefit and even the betterment of these Corinthian Christians? In order to answer this, we need look no further than to Paul's list, where he lists everything in the previous chapter, in chapter 11. I'll read verses 23 through 28. Are they ministers of Christ? Rhetorically, he asks, speaking of and referring to these fake apostles. I speak as a fool. I am more in labors more abundant, in stripes above measure, in prisons more frequently, in deaths often. From the Jews, five times I received 40 stripes minus one. Three times I was beaten with rods. Once I was stoned. Three times I was shipwrecked. A night and a day I have been in the deep, in journeys often, in perils of waters, in perils of robbers, in perils of my own countrymen, in perils of the Gentiles, in perils in the city, in perils in the wilderness, in perils in the sea, in perils among false brethren, in weariness and toil, in sleeplessness often, in hunger and thirst, in fastings often, in cold and nakedness, besides the other things, what comes upon me daily, my deep concern for all the churches. That's the everything he's referring to. And moreover, that's the everything that he is saying is for them, to edify them, to strengthen them to be for the good for them, to encourage them. Have you ever felt like that the trial you're in may in fact be for somebody else? I know right now somebody's coming to mind. <laughs> I mean, I'm going through this trial for them. Well, not necessarily like that. One of the things I'm learning in my own walk with the Lord is that Sometimes my trials, though chiefly for me, are also for the betterment of other people. And here's why. People are watching our lives. People are watching to see how we're going to deal with that fiery trial in our life, that thorn in our flesh. How are they going to handle this? What, how, how are they going to get through this? And they're watching to see. And by the way, in a good way, they want you to overcome and to be victorious. And the reason they want you in your trial with your thorn in the flesh to be victorious is because that gives them hope for their trial. Their thorn in the flesh. It was really interesting when our daughter Noelle died. Uh, the church was really small at the time. In fact, we had just started the church. And there couldn't have been more than probably 50 people in the church at that time. This was back in 2006, 2007. And it was interesting because people were watching to see how my wife and I were going to handle this. This is the ultimate, the death of your own child. And they were watching to see if I was going to keep my hands to the plow. Surely, you know, marriages don't even survive the death of a child. In fact, the percentage is in the 90s. 90 plus percent of couples, if they experience the death of a child, they'll end up in a divorce. So they're watching to see how we're going to we had just started the church. I'm working full time in my tent ministry, as it were, and I kept my hands to the plow. And after our daughter Noel died, I kept my hands to the plow. Instead of my wife and I going that direction, it brought us closer together. 
I mean, when you experience the death of your own child, when your daughter dies in your arms, it's, it's like this. If I can make it through that, if God can get me through that, there's nothing too hard for the Lord. So I kept my hands to the plow. When people began to see that this was not just like any other guy from the mainland who comes to Hawaii, starts a church, who doesn't want to come to Hawaii? You know, here am I, Lord, send me. Hawaii, not Zimbabwe, Hawaii. Right? And the best counsel I got was, you better know you're called. Because what happens is these guys come from the mainland, and they make it about two years, and they realize how hard it is and how expensive it is. And they end up moving back to the mainland, and in so doing, they leave a bad taste in people's mouth. And it didn't dawn on me that it was that very trial that God was using in the lives of other people. And they watched my wife and I. And when they realized that we weren't going anywhere, that we were committed, that this is what God had called us to, then they committed. And what was so interesting is the church began to grow and God began to add the numbers because, man, if, you know, after their daughter died, they're not going anywhere, this guy's committed. And when they saw that I was committed, then they committed as well. I'm of the belief that people want to know two things, whether they're a believer or not, by the way. The first thing they want to know is, is your Christianity real? Is your faith real? Are you the real deal? And the second thing they want to know is, does it work? Does your faith work? Does Christianity work? And again, they want it to work. Because if it doesn't work in your life, then they have no hope for their life. They want to see you walk in victory. They want to see you overcome. They want to see the supernatural, almighty hand of an all-sufficient, gracious God in your life. They want to see God do miracles in your life because they want God to do miracles in their life. They want to know that it works. They want to know that it's real. And they're watching us. Sometimes for years, they're watching you. No pressure. <laughs> but they're watching you. And if it's real in your life, and it works in your life, then they'll want that for their life. I need to move on to the last one here. This last truth concerning trials is that they give us a much needed compassion for others. I really wish I had more time to kind of develop this, but in verse 20, Paul says he fears that when he comes, he'll find and he, quite a list here, quite gnarly contentions, jealousies, fits of rage, selfish ambition, slander, backbiting, gossip, arrogance, and disorder. Wow, how'd you like to go to that church? He says in verse 21, he fears that God will humble him when he visits them in the sense that he will be grieved, in the sense that he will mourn over them. This is going to break his heart. Why? because they haven't repented of their uncleanness. And there's quite the specificity here. He talks about sexual immorality, fornication, debauchery. You have to understand this carnal Corinthian church, man, they were into all kinds of stuff. Much like today, sadly. But I see the Apostle Paul as brutal as he was, as blunt as he was, as sarcastic as he was in his sanctified sarcasm with these Corinthian Christians, I mean, he's brutal. You could almost get the impression that he doesn't really like them. 
Listen to how he's writing to them and talking about them. He must not really like them. No, the opposite is true. Think of it this way. If he didn't love them, he wouldn't bother. Why bother? Listen, if if I didn't love you, I am certainly not going to be grieved over you. I'm not going to mourn over you. If I don't love you, I don't care about you. I'm not even going to bother. Why waste the time? We're to speak the truth in love, but that really means that we speak the truth because we love. The proverb says that the wounds of a friend are faithful and can be trusted, but an enemy multiplies kisses. In other words, if you really love me, you're going to speak truth to me. You're going to tell me what I need to hear. I'm not going to want to hear it, but I need to hear it. And if you love me enough, you'll tell me what I need to hear. If you don't love me, you're only going to tell me what I want to hear. That's self-love, by the way. You're unwilling in your self-love to jeopardize the relationship with that person. And so you'll only flatter them, tell them what they they want to hear. No, it's the one who really loves me that will say to me, you know, brother, um, this is sin. This is sin. And you need to repent. You need to repent. That's love. And that's the kind of love that the Apostle Paul had. He cared so much for them. He loved them so much that he was willing to do this, fully knowing that it could jeopardize his relationship with them. You'll forgive, again, the abrupt close, but Lord willing, next week we'll pick this up in the last chapter of Paul's epistle, chapter 13. And then after we're done with 2 Corinthians, we're going to start in the book of Galatians. Can't wait for that. Ephesians, Philippians, Colossians, and then 1 and 2 Thessalonians. And then the rapture is going to happen because 1 and 2 Thessalonians are all about the rapture. So I, anyway, we'll, we'll go through, I know, let's go through Galatians, Ephesians, Philippians, and Colossians really, really fast. Let's pray. Father in heaven, thank you so much. Thank you for the love as an example to us that the Apostle Paul had for these Christians there in Corinth. Lord, I pray for anybody here today that's really going through a difficult trial that you would just encourage their hearts and minister to them, that you would comfort them by the Holy Spirit, that you would just remind them that You have a purpose in this. You're allowing this for a reason. Lord, thank you. In Jesus' name, amen.